in a couple weeks, March 19th, on Sunday, we are going to have baptism. So if you have never been water baptized, um, probably in the next couple weeks, we'll talk a little bit more about it just briefly on a Sunday. But we also do a class just before water baptism to make sure people understand you know, just what we believe and why we believe in water baptism. And the reality is this is one of those things that we see Jesus do with his followers. We see it all through the book of Acts. We believe this is a commandment, really. You know, as Jesus says, Matthew 28, he says, go into all the world, preach the good, or uh, I'm quoting the wrong one. Um, that was Mark 16. But Matthew 28, he says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And one of those commands is he tells people to be water baptized. And there's this place where, yes, it's a symbol of something like this, this acknowledgement publicly that you are, you know, kind of giving your life to Christ. But I actually believe it's more than symbolic. It really does something. There's something spiritual that happens when we take signifying acts to represent what God does. And ba water baptism, just in the briefest way to make sure you understand this, what it says this is that in water baptism, we join in Christ's death. Doesn't that sound inviting? But the truth is this, and we talk about this every Good Friday, why we say Good Friday even before Easter, is that what Jesus did on the cross was nail to the cross all the worst parts of us. All the stuff we don't really want to be, all the things that are wrong with us, the sin, the brokenness, all of that stuff was paid for on the cross. So literally, when we join with him in his death, it's killing the worst parts of you. Now, here's the, po here's the point. If you're really honest with ourselves, don't we look in the mirror and wish there were parts we could kill? In a healthy way. I'll tell you, my mind, anger. Now, I've, I've, you know, I've stabbed it quite a few times now. Sorry if this is a weird analogy for you all. But I've had this struggle with anger almost my entire life. And, and most, people, most people that know me kind of at least in the friendship acquaintance way, it's a kind of a surprising act unless you knew me many years ago. And then you remember some moments. And it takes a lot for it to kind of boil up and out. But there's this place where when I think about the cross, I think that God took the parts of me that I don't want to be. The part that I was never designed to be. And so when we join with him in water baptism, it's literally this washing away of all that stuff. And I believe it can actually happen right there and then in that moment. That when someone goes under the water and comes up, they're, they're changed. They're new. That's what the scripture teaches us. And so if you've never been water baptized and you follow Jesus, you know Christ, doesn't matter how long it's been. If it's been today, if you, if you join the family of God, or if you've been following him for 40 years, but you've never been water baptized, I would just admonish you, sign up for it. We do have limited spots. Actually, I have no idea how many spots we have left. I haven't looked. I know we have a few sign up because, you know, some Sunday, actually, I think one Sunday we had like 18, and that was just a lot. Um... The last time we did it, that made us realize, oh, we don't do this often enough. So um, if you want to sign up, you can do that online or on the Church Center app. All right. So today's message is hunger and thirst. Um, you know, last week, if you were here, I really just, I felt like we had a great time together. I, I really just believing that God is stirring something right now in first in this nation, but I really think he's stirring something in the hearts of people. And what he's stirring is, this is the way I can sum it up, a dissatisfaction for what's always been. And for me, when I think about Christianity and religion, and you look back through the history of humanity, We've gone through this constant cycle where we have these moments and experiences with God. And you can see it with the nation of Israel. And you can see it with just Abraham's family even before that. And you see these constant cycles where people experience God's goodness. And, and really actually what it usually is, this: there's a freedom moment. He comes and saves them. So Jesus being the Savior to us is not a new thing. It's been that way since the beginning of humanity. There's this saving moment whether it's the Israelites being freed from Egypt or whether it's them crossing the Jordan Sea again or whether it's being freed over and over in the book of Judges. There's this saving moment where God shows up and there's this light bulb revelation in the people's eyes of who God is. 
And it's like we wake up like, oh, yes, there's God again. And he's great and he's wonderful and, and there's awe and wonder and there's this humility in the hearts of people. And then what you see in the cycle of following God or knowing God is that by a second, third, or fourth generation, sometimes God has been completely forgotten. You know, it's like if I don't somehow, even for my own kids, let them experience God for themselves, they can't possibly know him through me. It's just impossible, I'll tell you that. As much as we want our kids to know God because of us, they have to know God because of them. And so there's this place even in Christianity and kind of the world at large where sometimes we go through these cycles and we see God move and then we kind of get used to it and we maybe get familiar with him like we talked last week and we, we start to just maybe get into the rote idea of things and we, we go back to knowledge because knowledge is always the easy way to go. It's like, oh, we're, we stopped experiencing God, so now we'll just learn about him. I got to go to church for 90 minutes and make sure I get my 40 minutes of learning in. And we forget about the fact that God wants to experience, experientially know us and for us to experientially know him. And I think that right now, in the body of Christ, God is saying, okay, let's wake up again. Let's wake up to who he is again. Let's experience him again beyond just what we know about him or even just beyond what we can read in scriptures, but what we can actually tangibly feel within us. Let's experience him again. And so that's my desire right now. In the church, I mean, it's been six months where I have felt convicted, honestly, as a leader. Six months ago when, I, when we started praying every week saying, my gosh, we just don't pray enough. What's wrong with us? <laughs> and believing that God wants to show up in power and in miraculous ways and in transformative ways in our lives. He wants to show up where we experience him. You know, there's this, uh, there was this time I was... Uh, our family, Jessica's family, really, on her side, we used to uh, every year go to Guggenheim. Um, her, her side of the family is very Catholic, and we would rent this huge, gorgeous cottage in Guggenheim, and the whole family would come from all around. And one of Jessica's relatives um, is uh, very intellectual, and he would always want to debate. He works at Harvard. Uh, he'll probably never watch this. Sorry if you do, Rob. Um, <laughs> he, he would always want to talk about God and the existence of God and, and really that there's this collective delusion happening in the world about God even existing and, and we always would have these talks and, and I would hate really debating because it, I'm like, yeah, I, you can't ever win a real debate when it comes around that. So I remember one night I, I was with his kids actually and we were out at the fire and, and you know, um, the, the best way to loosen up people's nerves is alcohol and so they were all drunk and it was like a perfect opportunity. Sorry if that's not holy enough for you. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to, they were asking me questions, and I, and I said, I'm going to share my testimony. And so I shared my testimony to them, and I haven't shared it here in a long time, but the truth was I, I, I struggled with depression and suicide, and I almost did it, and then God saved me in the midst of it, and I had this long story of, of God saving my life, and I'm looking over at, at this guy's kids who have debated the same things with me for years, and they're crying, and I said, you know what? This is why no matter what anybody else says, I know he's real. I said, you could burn every one of these books in the entire world. And no Bible exists, and I would know God is real, because I experienced him. No one can take away the story of what God has done in my life. No one can say, well, that didn't happen to you. Or maybe they just think I'm crazy and I, I thought it up, but I don't care, because to me, it's more real than anything I can touch. And so there's this experience that we have to grab hold of, and if we haven't experienced him in, in this way, we literally need to pursue it. There's this hunger and thirst. This is, this is where I want to go with this, that there's this place where I think as Christians, some of us, and I will say I have been guilty of this many times, and even in recent years, where we get apathetic. Where apathy takes over what we're believing for. And for me, I have had some severe disappointments in my life. I have severe disappointments with God. Is that okay for me to say? 
I have these expectations of what I wanted my family and life to look like, and I, I have two special needs kids. Now, I believe in healing, and I pray for healing thousands of times. They're not healed. And so I have these things that can grab hold of my life and have created almost this place of apathy in me where I come and I serve God, like all of you, but I haven't been reaching for much experience with him anymore. And that's maybe just one reason. Disappointment and disillusionment can cause that. But there's all sorts of things that can kind of come into our life and cause an apathy where we just become Christians, who go to church on Sunday, who do our Bible studies and our small groups and our programs, and somehow even in the midst of, of the things that we try to set up to experience God, we forget about experiencing him. We forget about the pursuit of knowing him. Matthew 5, 6, start in our notes. I, here we are, I just began my message. And last week I read Matthew 5.5, 5, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. But I want to read Matthew 5.6 now. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus puts in this Sermon on the Mount, these beatitudes, these blessed moments, and he puts this one, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we look at righteousness and it can be described in so many ways. It can simply be described as, as being holy or maybe being set apart, this place where we're living in a right way. But, but in a lot of ways, righteousness is supposed to mean that we're in right standing with somebody. It means that if there was a separation in a relationship, that you've now come back in that relationship and connected, you're now in a righteous standing. You're in right standing. And when this says that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think that he's saying we're supposed to hunger and thirst for right standing with God. That we're supposed to be in relationship with God and, we're, and there's supposed to be a hunger and thirst inside of us that draws us to that relationship. And the blessing of that is this, they will be satisfied. Man, how simple an idea, but how aloof a thought. If I think there's anything true about the United States of America, it's this, we are not satisfied people. We're always grabbing at something else, something more, reaching for other things, more money, more prestige, more followers, a bigger house, a nicer car, a newer snowmobile, whatever it is. We're always reaching for something for satisfaction, but, but when we have these moments in life where reality checks in, we realize we aren't satisfied. And yet we see here in this moment that Jesus is saying there's only one thing that can satisfy you, to hunger and thirst for connection with him. To hunger and thirst for right standing with him. I want to read this story of John 4. I won't read the whole thing. I'll tell you it. But we'll turn to John 4 and this story where Jesus talks a little bit about this idea again. You've got this woman that he meets at the well. And it's really one of my favorite stories. He meets this woman at the well. And she's a Samaritan woman. And he's a Jew and a rabbi, and they're not supposed to be talking. He begins this conversation with them, and he asks for a drink of water. And she says, why are you asking me for a drink of water? And then he turns the tables around, right? And he says, listen, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water, because the water I would give you would, you know, if you drink this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink the water I'd give you, you'd never thirst again. He goes on, that's in your notes. Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. And he starts this conversation. And I, I love this because what he's trying to do is he's trying to intrigue and wake her up in this moment. And I think that's kind of the first stage for all of us, that there's a place where we kind of just get into a slumber of life. And Jesus now, he's kind of giving these posing questions, and then he starts to ask her, about some things, and he says, hey, why don't you go and get your husband? Of course, he knows the answer about what's happening. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, you're right, because you've had five. And he, like, hits her in probably the most wounded places of, of her life. 
this place where she's had broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship, and he goes right at it for her. And she tries to evade it by just saying, oh, you must be a prophet. Let me ask you a spiritual question so we don't have to talk about my five husbands. And Jesus kind of sidesteps that question. He says, oh, that question's not even going to matter soon. Talks about worshiping on this mountain or that mountain. It's not even going to matter soon. And he ends up revealing to her, this is the first person that he says these words to. He says to her, I am the Messiah. And this incredible moment takes place with this woman where she comes to the recognition of who he is as the Messiah they've been looking for. He validates who she is, and then she runs off to the town to tell everybody. And the story is she brings the whole town back, and many are saved, and many come to knowing Jesus. But this is the part I want to pick on. So the disciples come back from the town, because what has happened is Jesus, they've been walking, they're tired, they're hungry, and they come to this well, and Jesus says, I'm going to stay at the well, but you go into town and give food for us. And they come back at the end of this conversation with the woman. And they're kind of confused by it too because she's a Samaritan. She's a woman, not supposed to be talking to her, not supposed to be associating with her. And they're all squabbling about it. And we get to verses 32 and 34 because they ask him, do you want to eat? And it says, Jesus replies, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. And Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. He, he starts to illuminate to them this idea that his sustenance is not just based on regular food. It's not based on what we would think that fulfillment is going to be based on. John 7, 38, Jesus says it again. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. He uses this language a lot of times, and he calls himself the bread of life. We're going to read that later. And he calls himself the eternal living water. There's this place where he's using this language because we all understand hunger and thirst, don't we? Probably not as much as you think you do. Go spend a week in Uganda. Their entire life revolves around getting a meal every day. I made one trip there to a refugee center. South Sudan is having all sorts of war problems, and so the best thing they can do is leave South Sudan, and there's, there was over 300,000 people in this camp, this refugee camp in northern Uganda, and, and these kids, I asked them what they were doing, and I asked the people I was with what they were doing. They were eating dirt because there's not enough food, and they just wanted to fill their stomachs with something. That's hunger. So we probably don't really understand hunger and thirst, but I think we can, we can grasp at it. That hot day, you're mowing the lawn, you're sweating, you're working hard. That long run you went on, that extra hour you waited to have lunch... <laughs> There's this place where we understand the pangs of hunger and thirst in our life. And Jesus is trying to use this as a comparison to say that's how we're supposed to feel about him. Now, if you've ever fasted in your life, after about a day or two, there's this thing where you, you literally can't stop thinking about food. And you're trying to like, if you've done it for you know, spiritual reasons, you're trying not to only think about food, but this is actually the point of fasting. I think sometimes we look at fasting, and I've, I've talked about this before, and we, we look at it as some sort of big lever, like we can have leverage with God if we do this holy act, and he's going to do something for us. The truth is, it's supposed to remind us how dependent we are on food, so that we can remember how dependent we're supposed to be on Jesus. Because go a day without food. You get tired and weak. You get grouchy. You can have tremors. There's all sorts of things that begin to happen just after a day. Imagine many days without food. And there's this place where that comparison that Jesus is using this language is supposed to say, this is what happens to you when you don't hunger and thirst for me. 
You see, our natural bodies tell us when we're hungry and thirsty. But sometimes we train our spiritual bodies so well to forget what it means to hunger and thirst for God. Or worse yet, this is the truth, we feed it with the wrong stuff. You see, we know as humans what we're supposed to eat, what's healthy and what's not healthy. I know a soda is basically poison, but it just tastes so good. Yet we still drink it. And so we fill our bodies sometimes with all these things that we know aren't great for us. And then when we come to a real meal, this is all of my children, just so you know. They're starving all day long, they say. Then they come to the meal that my wife made and they're like, I'm not that hungry. Basically what they're saying is, I just want to eat the bag of Doritos. Because they've trained themselves to eat this junk when we're supposed to be eating something healthy. And the same is true with Jesus. That there's this hunger and thirst for righteousness, this place where we're supposed to hunger and thirst for this right relationship with God, but we've trained ourselves to hunger and thirst for the wrong things. And we've actually begun to fill our lives with things that maybe hide the fact that we need Jesus desperately every single day. And my prayer in this moment in our church In this nation is this, that the things we've been filling ourselves with would be completely dissatisfying. You ever love some food so much you eat it too much, and then you're like, I never want to eat that again? The students, we always take the students from Momentum to a village diner in Potsdam, and they have this pancake challenge. Anybody ever been there? The pancake is, it's probably the size of this table. It's huge. And I remember the first time we did this, I took David Tomford. I don't know if David's in here today. And David, of course, like a champ, he ate that whole thing. Now, he was like, I love pancakes. And so he got pancakes with chocolate chips in it. And they actually warned him, you probably shouldn't do that. But no, David knew better. But he still, he ate the whole thing. And literally after that, I think it was five months later, he says, I still haven't touched a pancake. (laughs) I hope this happens to us with the world. That what we've been stuffing ourselves with with the world becomes so dissatisfying we can't deal with it anymore. And that we actually run back to the thing that really satisfies us, which is Jesus. Deuteronomy 8. I was reading this this week. Kind of want to spend the last five or ten minutes here. Deuteronomy 8. You've got this rereading of the law. And the reason they're rereading the law is because the same thing had happened. They'd been in the wilderness for a long time now. And the generation that had left Egypt is now mostly dead. But they're still in the desert and they haven't come into the promised land. And there's this moment where Moses realizes, I need to reread the law to the people who haven't heard it. They don't remember it anymore. And so Deuteronomy is the second reading of the law, and he's reading to these these people again to remind them of these things. And I want to read uh, 18 scriptures here in Deuteronomy, so keep up with me. And there's a part that I want to get to. So Deuteronomy 8 verse 1. Again, Moses reading, he says, Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply. And you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna. Do you see this whole manna thing that happens in the in the wilderness, and I think this is literally Jesus God. He's been trying, he's trying to teach his people right from the get-go. Listen, the food that you would make yourselves isn't good enough. Let me give you the food. So it was literally this symbolic, metaphoric way to say, I will give you what you really need. It says, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. We talked about fear of the Lord last week. Holding him in this place of awe and wonder. Not reducing him to this familiar place where we actually devalue the relationship with him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. Here's all the promises, right? It's a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees, and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It's a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It's a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. So listen to this. He's, he's reminding them, remember to obey the commands. Then he's going to multiply and bless you. And when you go into the promised land, this is what it's going to be like. And he's listing all these beautiful promises. And then he gets to verse 11. And I want to say this. I think this is where we're at. I think verse 11 right here and in in some of these ones after is for us right now. So he says, all these promises, when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Verse 11, but that is the time to be careful. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands. His regulations Decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its snakes and scorpions and it was hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. Again, he reminds him, he did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Listen to this. Be careful. (laughs) See, there's this tense place in Christianity that when we experience God and he comes into our life, even in power and incredible ways, and we see him fulfill a promise that we actually grow familiar with it and we forget that he's the one that did it to begin with. And he says, be careful when you've built fine homes to live in and when you've multiplied and when you're doing well, don't forget me. And I would just say that I'm going to point my finger at the American church as a whole. That as the American church, it's been easy for us to forget him. We've got our fine homes and our nice cars and our good jobs We've got the blessings of the land that God has given us. He's blessed us in innumerable ways. Yes, we have struggles and difficulties, but by and large, we turn to our own usefulness before we turn to God. We turn to our own ways of fixing something and remedying something before we ever turn to God. Why? Because we have more than we even need. And Moses, as he's reading this to the people of Israel, and he's reminding them of God's rules and laws, he's saying, this is the moment to be careful. And I think that's true for us, that we need to be careful that we haven't fallen asleep on what we're supposed to be hungering and thirsting for. That our lives are actually positioned and pursuing after all the things that God has for us. That when we come to church on Sunday, it isn't just because we're supposed to or because maybe we need a a little this or a little that, but that we're actually pressing in for God's presence. We're pressing in for God to do something incredible. That we're starting with just quickly the reminder that he is above everything else. That's why we started with how great is our God. Because we wanted to just remember, he's great. 
Above all my circumstances, above all my needs, he's great. I put this quote, well, I'll read this proverb I put in your notes, 27.7. It says, a person who is full refuses honey, but even bitter food tastes sweet to the hungry. When we're full already, it's hard to be hungry for the right things. You know, we're actually in this season of Lent that we don't really talk about a lot as a, as a non-denominational church or really as a not traditional church. But Lent was this season and it was built in programmatically, purposely into the liturgy of the Catholic Church. And they're the ones that started it because of this very reason. They wanted a season every year that was supposed to remind people of their need for God. Now what's funny is even when we build programs to remind us of things, we forget why we started them. But this season was always supposed to lead up to Easter, lead up to that week of, of his, res his death and his resurrection and all those blessings. But it was supposed to start with the reminder of who God is and how desperately we're in need of him. That's why Lent is always about giving something up. But if we don't remember why we even do that, that's kind of pointless. But there's this place where I believe that we, I'm hoping God causes us to hunger in a new way. That the things that satisfied us and maybe filled our stomachs so that we didn't even give room for hunger and thirsting for God would actually be depleted. That we would feel the pangs of hunger and thirst and we would pursue him. John Piper. I don't love everything John Piper says. I have to say that. But I like this quote. He has this book called Hungering for God. He says, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Our soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. Jesus says, John 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus promises to truly satisfy us, yet we spend much of our lives trying to satisfy ourselves in other ways. The worship team come back up. You know, there's this story I want to end with, and, and we're going to go into worship. We're going to have a couple songs. I want to have a time of prayer. Just letting God minister, letting us press in just a little bit more this morning. But before I do, there's this story that I love. And I didn't put it in your notes because I thought of it while we were in worship. And it's in Matthew 15. And I'll just give you some background to it. But there's this moment where this Gentile woman comes looking for Jesus. Verse 21 of chapter 15 says, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Basically he's saying, I came here for the Jews. It's interesting. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord help me. Jesus responded, and here's nice Jesus coming out. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Wow. Wow. That's kind. And he's literally saying, like he's calling the Gentiles dogs, which would have been a common term for them from the Jewish people. This is a moment that's interesting. And I really, I think it's interesting because I kind of think it's a test from Jesus. He basically insults her. He tells her to leave. The disciples tell her to leave. He ends up insulting her. And in verse 27, she replies, that's true, Lord. But even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. What a response. She gets over multiple rejections and an insult to her people and to herself. Why? Because she's desperate. Verse 28, dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith 
is great and your request is granted and her daughter was instantly healed. I want to be like that woman. I hope Jesus doesn't insult me in the process. But I want to be like that woman. Meaning that I want to be so desperate for Jesus that no matter what obstacle comes, even if it's religious in its nature, that a religious obstacle comes and pushes us back. I mean, tell me, how many of that has that happened to? You've gotten hurt in church and you've gotten disillusioned in church and someone that should know God has insulted you and, and there's this place where we're supposed to step over it and constantly pursue Jesus. I want to have the hunger that that lady had. Can we stand this morning? What do you need to stop eating to be hungry for the right things? What do you need to stop eating in your life? Maybe some of us, it's literal food. Maybe some of us, it's how many hours you spend on your phone or how many hours you watch Netflix or maybe... Some of us, it's how many hours you literally, you know, spend avoiding other people. What is it that we're supposed to stop nibbling on that's from this world that's been filling our stomachs with things that causes us not to even hunger and thirst for the right things? Let God put his finger on you today. And we're going to worship here in a moment. I'm going to pray. And I want to open the front again. You know, we had some people come down during worship this morning. It was awesome. I want to invite you down. Listen, last week I invited people down. Some people came down. And, and then near the end, I, I kind of gave this latch dish call. Like, listen, even if you're in your seats, raise your hand. The truth is this. I think that coming down front, there's nothing holy about the front of the church. But I think it's a purposeful recognition to leave where you're at and go to where Jesus is. He's not up here more than he's in your seat, but it's a symbolic act. It's a metaphorical idea to say, I'm not going to be where I am anymore. And so in a minute, I'm going to pray, and the worship team's just going to lead in worship. We're going to sing a couple songs, and we'll probably have people to pray for you. But if, if you want to pursue Jesus, I would encourage you, get out of your seat and do it. Get out of your seat and, and chase after him in some tangible way. Just for the next 10, 15 minutes, pursue him and ask God. Maybe you're like, I don't even know how to hunger and thirst for him. Just say, God, help me hunger for you. Maybe you're listening or you're in this room. And you're like, I don't even know Jesus yet. It's simple. All you have to do is say this, Jesus, I want to follow you. I don't want to go my own way anymore. I don't want to do it my own way anymore. I want to follow you. And right then and there, he starts bringing you along. Repentance is simply looking at the crooked way you've been walking and walking a different way. And so you choose it. Jesus, I don't want to go the crooked way. I want to go your straight way now. And it can begin in a moment. So I'm going to pray. And I, I would just ask you, press in. Press in today. God, we thank you that you're moving in this place. God, we thank you that you're moving in our hearts. God, even right now, everyone in this room, everyone watching online, I would ask right where you're at, whisper out loud, God, make me hungry for you. Jesus, make me hungry for you. Make me hunger and thirst for the right things. God, we repent of all the junk food of life that we've been eating. God, we repent of all the things that we've been filling our lives up with that is not of you. God, we want just you today. God, let us be desperate like that Gentile woman who just stepped over obstacle after obstacle and said, it doesn't matter, I'll take even the scraps. God, we'll take whatever you want to give us this morning. Jesus, we need you this morning. Come and minister. Come in power, God. Come in your presence in Jesus' name. If, if you want to pursue, I would just welcome you. Come down front as we worship.